seeing Bond at the start of this sequence driving with Madeline in the DB5. Why would I betray you? We all have our secrets. Instantly, it's just an iconic shot. Just didn't get to yours yet. This time, the relationship between Bond and Madeline is much more developed. The story is more emotionally driven than it is action driven. Vesper Lind is buried in Matera and Madeline has guided Bond there, and Madeline, I think, feels like he should forgive her. The trouble is, um, somebody's watching them. We are famed for having the best opening sequences for any franchise. For me, this sequence is one of the big sequences that makes you feel, OK, I'm on a James Bond movie. You've got many things that really make it appealing. First of all, you've got the beautiful location. Matera, Italy, which is one of the oldest uh, cities in the world. Then throw into the equation the car, the fantastic, legendary DB5. It gets people's juices going, but because of the gadgets it has, and we, we use them all. Kerry wanted it to be gritty, but he didn't want it to be over the top. So when we originally scouted it and Kerry basically signed off, loved the city, it fit story-wise for us as well. Then we had to go about how we're going to break it down, how we're going to achieve a high-speed chase. And so one of the main problems with Matera is which bit do you shoot it in? We were looking going up steps, down steps. It was finding the actual right combination of streets to do it in. It was very challenging to find a way to still keep the speed up. It was constantly evolving, even up to when we shot it, which was probably six months later, we were still evolving the sequence. Is it the way you're going to film it? Is it just the stunt itself? Is it the way we want to have the actor doing it all the time? And then how are we going to do that to make it safe? Action! Olivia Schneider and I had long conversations about the fighting style to make it fit the character. There's a brutal simplicity to it now that's just come with age. And all the time you try to put the line as far as you can because you don't want the audience to be disappointed. The action comes out of a fight or die situation. I think therefore the, the action itself becomes more exciting because you actually care about the characters. There's a motorbike chase right at the beginning, all in the incredible backdrop of Matera. The moment where Bond jumps the motorcycle, it's a big moment, actually, because it was very last minute. Lee and I, even Daniel, we were thinking, like, we missed something here. We need a Bond moment. That idea didn't come about eight months earlier. When you typically would do that and, and plan out all the dangers. That came about probably four weeks before we pulled off the stunt. And we wanted to build a ramp that looked like it should be there in place. It, it looks like a wall. So to look like a wall, it had to be really steep at 65 degrees. This is a section where we see Bond traveling at high speed on the motorcycle he's taking for Primo. And you see the structure we've had to put in place because we had to make sure the ramp would take the loadings. This section where it's critical, John's now working on the ramp. As far as just past where George is now coming down, he's committed at that point. There's no going back. Speed runs for now, Paul. Right, yeah, really good. I think just with the drive you've got coming in, yeah. just do two, three more, yeah. and then you're ready to go. Stunt rider Paul Edmondson, who doubled Bond, one of the best riders in the world, four times world champion. Technically, no problem whatsoever. But then come the day of actual rehearsals, and when you actually get to the bottom of the ramp, both of us were having a little look at each other. We both knew that you had to hit it at a certain speed. So it was full commitment, because when you're jumping a motorcycle up a ramp that steep and covering 35, 40 feet, but you're going up almost vertically, you become almost like a sail. You're not going forward through the air, you're going up, and so the wind can catch you. And unfortunately, the day of shooting, it's going the wrong direction. So it was blowing off to the area where we were going to land. Everybody waiting, everybody's getting tense, everybody's ready to go to roll cameras, but the wind's too strong. Yeah, you know, it's one of those, you've, you've got to commit, but at the same time treat it with respect and think about what you're doing. So when you put all that together, that's when it becomes interesting. To 
see him go over the first time was uh, a massive relief. It's not VFX, it's real. They did it. You need guys of that caliber to achieve things like that in the time you do it. In this garage at the moment, we've got all the action vehicles that you would have seen up till now. Behind me, we've got 10 Aston Martin DB5s. We had two what we call hero cars, which are original DB5s. This is the car that Sean Connery first appeared with. Yeah, this is the car that always, always appears, that is synonymous with 007. This has always been the car that Daniel does the pull-ups and the pull-aways from. Now, these two cars, to the eye, are identical to the first two, but these are actually stunt replica cars that's all kitted out. Uh, my job is uh, quite a cool one. I get the chance to drive the DB5 as James Bond. Uh, we go into some very sort of high-speed roads, as high as they can be for these type of roads. We've had a big challenge with the surface. It's very, very slippery. And in fact, we've actually used Koala on the surface to give us some grip back, which works really well. <laughs> so it's built to do what we want it to do. Um, it's a beautiful handling car. It's a, it's a pleasure to drive, and it's a very special little toy. There's a particularly far stretch of road running alongside the valley in Matera, and in that spot, the DB5 could really open up. DB5's travelling at speed. We was at speeds at 100 plus sometimes along the gorge road. And the good thing about Mark is the faster the speeds go, the better he gets. The DB5 I'm in now, it, it's been built from the ground up with competition suspension. It's got about 340 horsepower. So these two cars, these are the stunt gadget cars, and these are the ones that you'll see in the film where all the gadgets are exposed. We obviously saw the, the guns working in Skyfall, and then the car itself gets destroyed. Spectre gets rebuilt, but we don't know what's inside it. We kind of had carte blanche to sort of reimagine what's in the car and what it could do. And to try to do it tastefully, obviously. We want it to fit within the narrative and the emotional story we're telling at the beginning of the film, but also, you know, have a little bit of fun with it, too. We refer to this as Donut Square. It's uh, San Giovanni Battista. It's where Bond gets cornered. Five, this is going to be a noisy two, moment. One, action, fire! After they've emptied their clips, um, James Bond says, right, now it's my turn. something like five, six hundred uh, pyrotechnic squibs on these four, five hundred year old churches. In some cases, we've been able to make some pre-rigged panels. They look exactly like the stonework. This is a very ancient church and we can't damage it at all. This is one of the panels we've made in the UK, wedged into position. It's actually foam. And in here, we've got a small explosive charge, which will give us a hole roughly this size. Virtually everything has got an explosive charge on it. Cars in the street over there. Yep. New stand, yep. steps, and they fit. Right. This is artificial stone. It's, it's a mixture of foam and insulation particles. It's very soft, but it looks like stone when it explodes. But you can stand next to this and it won't hurt. This is our circular striker. Each of these switches will operate a sequencer. So as the car spins round, it'll activate those switches, which will then operate an automatic firing box. So it means that we can always be in sync with the position of the car. We're putting hits along the wall here, and they go all around the square. You see, it's 360 degrees of carnage. The great thing about this shot is Daniel actually did the donut himself. He floored it, put it into a donut, and did a complete 360. It does everything that Bond's DB5 should do. We do it and more. It was fun. It was really fun. Spinning around, I would do it again. With Daniel doing the car work and having the confidence of Lee Morrison there to sort of guide him through it, 
having Chris Corbald, who's you know, a magician with the special effects, having complete trust that, that everything, everyone is safe, everyone's gonna do something and you can walk away from it, but it's also gonna look spectacular. It's really important to get the action just right so it becomes believable. And what we're doing here, it is a little scrappy, it is aggressive, and it is for real. Hopefully it'll be another Bond iconic moment. Doing stunts for real is always gonna feel that much more exciting. Everyone ups each other's game, just keeps building up to have these amazing scenes. There's some powerful, powerful moments in this film. You know, alongside all the action, it was quite exhilarating. Matera is, in the last 20 years, probably the most challenging city I've ever worked in. To have all these masterminds come together to help us bring this to life, that is the sort of the dream come true part of, of making a movie this big. It's a satisfying emotional journey for an audience if they're invested in the characters, and that hopefully makes it fascinating to watch. James Bond movies are action-adventure movies. If they're real and they feel real, then that makes it fascinating to watch. So much of the action sequences in this film are shot practically, and they are riveting. The reality of real humans doing these things, I think, is, is so much better. I think audiences feel the same way. It would be so much easier to say, OK, let's put a 3D car here and let's do that. But no, that's not the way we do. That's not what we love to do. I think for us on a Bond, you know that there's a high risk. When they call action, that's a real person jumping off of the cranes or crashing the car or jumping the motorcycle, which is far more rewarding as a stunt coordinator and a stuntman rather than working in just a green screen environment. All the stunt guys in the world want to work on a Bond film. The first thing I start thinking about is how can we make it better? How can we make all the action more spectacular? The Cuban Streets is where Bond goes in to extract a character in the film. And it starts in Spectre event where it kicks off. A lot is going on in that scene. We had no me character starting on the roof, ready to kidnap Valdo. She was hoping to drop 30 feet high, catch him and go back up. One of the things I was first impressed with in Mashana is um, her physicality, her speed, the precision of her movements was very impressive. Every single day they were training me hard, um, having me on all different weapons, different setups. I think Paloma is a surprise. I don't think people expect something like her. Paloma uses three different guns. She runs with them, she changes them in action. So I really wanted to get it right and look like I knew what I was doing. I really enjoyed that part. <laughs> Bond escapes from the Cuban set in a seaplane um, and then she takes off and lands next to her, looks like an abandoned trawler. The explosion, we had to be mindful that it was a real trawler. So we had to do it in such a way that we, we could guarantee we weren't going to damage it. So we did many tests back in Long Cross at my base. It was all directional, so we knew exactly where it was going to go. I mean, we knew it wasn't going to spread to any other parts of the boat. When confronted with the fact that we had to sink the boat, we then started to create the rig that could do that. It's my favorite rig on the film, I have to say. I love those mechanical rigs where you program them because it can roll 360 degrees and then lower into the six meter deep tank of water. Relax! Daniel and Jeffrey did a great job swimming to it, trying to get out. The first day that we went down to rehearse and the thing flooded, I, I just couldn't stop grinning. Which is great fun, you know, you're thinking, wow, we call this work, huh? Absolutely one of the best rigs I've ever seen. It was for real. We took that under the water and there was an air pocket. Really, really eerie set to be in, because you're not only trying to control your breath and think about the action and think about the story, but it's trying to keep calm, but still get that emotion across on camera. Really, really challenging environment, that. The other chase in the film was totally different to the Matera chase. It starts in Scotland, doubling as Norway. 
Bond now is driving a Toyota Land Cruiser. Not the fastest of vehicles, but very, very hardy. And then you see a flash of two Range Rover SVRs blast past. And then he's just purely driving on instinct, trying to evade and get away from these guys. Defenders coming down from high ridge lines, jumping over ledges. You'd have the motorcycles, all vehicles driving across the river multiple times. I was building certain terrains where they're hitting at 50 to 70 miles an hour. And Daniel's in there, you know, basically mixing it up with everybody. You know, bikes riding alongside, banging into the side of him. Defenders trying to shove him into the river. Really spectacular chase and look fantastic. For the Battlestar scene, it was when Bond and Naomi are in the lair of Safin. And they get split in the third act, we're still missing a special moment action-wise for Bond. And then we come up with that Battlestar scene, which I'm very proud of. I felt physically, was I going to be up to it? But actually, we, we figured it out on this one. We don't have any less action. I mean, if anything, I kind of just do as much as I've ever done. Daniel and Carrie really wanted a fierce, fierce firefight. And it was particularly intense. There were many, many bullet hits that we um, embedded into the walls. And Daniel was shooting. There was uh, grenades going off. On the third shot, grenades already rolling at that point. He's coming out, sees the grenade. And that's when we're pushing around for that. It was a really emotional moment for all of us because it's Bond's final battle. And the end of Daniel's reign as Bond's, I wanted to make sure he got sent off in a great way. Yeah, it was very emotional that day, and I will remember that all my life. One of the exciting things about the idea of a spy out in the world doing things is all the exotic locations they go to, all the places in the world that we may never go to. The locations become characters, and I think it helps to give the film some, some oxygen and some scale. The locations have been absolutely insane. For me, Bond was an early cinematic hero that transcended uh, geography and nationality. watch the beginning of a Bond film, you are expecting some kind of spectacle, right? In some ways, I wanted to subvert that in Norway. We have a surprise opening, which is not even from Bond's perspective. Thematically, we felt it worked really well. It was a beautiful canvas. There's something dreamlike about this. It's about being haunted by these figures from your past and how those figures can really hang over you throughout your entire life. This lake is normally a sea of snow with a very thin layer of ice underneath. We have, through the process of removing the snow and allowing the cold nights to naturally freeze the water on the surface of the lake, managed to cultivate it and create a safe working environment for our crew and also build our house in the background. The frozen lake water forms a type of ice that we call steel ice and it's this very strong ice. In English, it's black ice. Half a meter uh, of black ice. You could run a very heavy tractor, like eight tons. So it has been a very efficient way of strengthening the ice. We wanted a sense of isolation, and we wanted a sense that they were separate from the world. We ended up with some very spooky and almost scary film footage. It's a Bond beginning unlike any other. We start the film with a flashback to her childhood and uh, trauma that she went through. Then we pick Bond and Leia up at Matera. They go through an action sequence. The stakes are very high. Matera is one of the oldest cities in the world. It's certainly one of the most extraordinary locations we've ever been in. We have the DB5, 
which was reconstructed after Skyfall and is in perfect condition and has a few added extras and does everything that Bond's DB5 should do, but we do it and more, all in this incredible backdrop of Matera. It is not built for the modern world in a way that the roads are narrow and short. It doesn't, from that point of view, seem like the obvious place to do a car chase. I think the skill and success of, of this sequence will be that you can use the hillside layout of the town to great effect with the stunt and special effects sequence. There was a lot of apprehension. Matera has never seen anything this size before. A lot of filming here, but just nothing on this scale. Well, it's hard to get the car going fast in a city like Matera, where the roads tend to be very narrow. We use the environment and the vehicle in a way that you don't expect. When you're doing car chases, you need to make sure that you have secure lock-offs so that no one wanders into the traffic. It is really amazing when you pull all of this off, and I'm mesmerized by the sheer scale of the whole operation. We are on Ardverakia Estate in the Scottish Highlands and we're filming New Bond. I was really, really keen to do a, a, a Bond driving chase sequence off-road in a really, really challenging environment. You know, up in the Highlands, it's stunning. Everywhere you look, it looks like you can drive. Normally you can't. You're working in a Bond film, the, the collective expectations are high. Everybody wants to make the best film possible. So you want to find the best locations that are going to work. You want to have the best stunts that are going to look spectacular on screen. They're genuinely driving down steep, rocky hillsides across rivers, going off ramps. The Scottish part of this car chase was enormous. It was an enormous undertaking. We, we essentially took over a private estate. Logistically, it was very complicated. Narrow roads, locations afar from each other. It's been a lot of work, but I think when you see the vehicle performing, it'll be quite a spectacle. Barbara mentioned early on the idea of going back to Jamaica for this story. Jamaica was the place where Ian Fleming created the character of Bond and wrote all the books and short stories there. He ends up living in Jamaica, which is basically James Bond's sort of spiritual home. It feels like such a Bond thing, whether it's Dr. No or Live and Let Die. The connection is, uh, is a solid one, and it felt like the right thing to do. Dr. No, the first James Bond film, was obviously shot in Jamaica, in Ocherias, Arakabesa area, which is the Golden Eye area. Even though the house that we built is nothing like where Fleming lived, you could feel the wildness and the, that living on the edge of nature that feels just right for a guy like Bond who has seen and experienced what he has and is looking to live a quieter, more peaceful life. And the Jamaicans have been incredible um, right from the get-go. Certainly in our props department, art department, construction, all of those key departments, we've we found great, great people in Jamaica. And it's been an absolute privilege working with them. This is an island of just stunning beauty. Not just the land, the water, but the people, the energy, the spirit, um, the culture that, that lives here. We have all of that that comes to bear and it really only helps to drive uh, the building of the character and drive the story forward. You know, all we have to do then as actors is just show up in the midst of that and, and live in it. I'm Jamaican. My parents are Jamaican, they're born and bred here. Jamaica is rich, flamboyant colours and it has a heat and a history and a grit to it that not many people get to see. And I feel very in touch being here and I feel grateful to bring my culture to the cinema. Uh, we're in Port Antonio in Jamaica where we shot part of our film that's supposed to be Cuba. The government here has been absolutely amazing and supportive for us. We've had incredible support from the Jamaican government. If you go and talk to um, a company and say, look, would you be interested in somebody flying a plane in very close proximity to your boat? They're going to say no. When you tell them James Bond's doing it, they're, they're up for it. We want the locations to be sensational and stunning. We want people to remember this film for every reason.
Bond movies are deeply ensconced in our culture, especially here in the UK. As a 25th film, we did a lot of thinking about what were the best moments that we'd seen in Bond movies and um, how would we pull some of those together for this final one for Daniel. James Bond. To be designing a Bond movie is a real privilege and it's sort of a treat. We're looking for new inventions, new ideas, a bit of scale, glamour, things that are sort of extraordinary. There's really a special feeling you're hit with when you step on a 007 soundstage and onto a set like that. We need these fantastic sets that, to set the scene for us, and, and Mark Tilsley is just, you know, one of the best in the world. We have come to Jamaica. We've built in, uh, in this old Coco Bay, we built Bond's house. This is um, Bond, who is now in retirement, has come back to a Bond spiritual home. Some of the kind of design features that you'll see in this house are taken from Fleming's villa. We've also got a reproduction of Fleming's desk in James Bond's bedroom. But what we wanted to do with this place was make it a little bit more rough and ready. The best way of achieving the look for us was to actually build it with local Jamaican guys. It has this kind of real local feel to the design of the place. The really tricky thing about this location is that there is no road. All of our materials had to come in by boat, so we had to actually build a pier here, and that was our, not only part of our set, but also the access for everything you see on this set. The most famously stylish man in the world needing to kind of blend in and not look as stylish as he normally does, but kind of still needs to look stylish. Everything he owned, we wanted it to feel like he had, to his core, intuition about style, but he doesn't think about it too much. It's just there. I wanted him to look like who he is. He's a bit older, he's a bit wiser. He doesn't run through quite as many walls as he used to. You know, he might take the door off its hinges. I wanted Nomi to have her own very strong, very self-possessed, sharp look. Whatever she was wearing, she'd have to be at the ready. Her clothes needed to be as stylish and utilitarian in the same measure as Bond's clothing was. Sutrak reads people really easily and quickly. She worked with my height, my shape, um, my skin tone, everything I felt like was just complementing who I was. Cuba was obviously at one time really wealthy and exotic, but now there's this sense of faded grandeur. It's even more exciting, actually, like looking at ancient Rome or something. We weren't able to do this in Cuba because there's a lot of fight work and all sorts of action that was going to be involved. So we had a building. There are 12 buildings on the Cuban set. Every building has a different purpose. The El Nido Bar is a specifically designed building using many references that we found in Havana. That building is one of the hero buildings, so therefore we had to adapt it in a certain way that worked for the action, a lot of stunt action. We wanted this grand classic romantic staircase. It's a very famous restaurant in Cuba, but it has a road that runs underneath the staircase and um, we wanted to try and emulate that. There was a definite deco feel that Carrie wanted, so you can see the sort of deco-esque lights. With the true Latin American feel, it's a very, very tall building. We're using all the elements, nothing's to waste here. This is a truly hero building for a bomb sequence. I am Cuban and I know exactly how Cuba looks like and I think it's very hard to recreate a country like this. This decadent aspect of it, so much color and it's so rich and the pass of time. It was really impressive, the level of detail on the scale of the sets. 
was a 360 functional set with entire buildings. It was like an immersion into Cuba. The Spectre event was a particularly juicy and satisfying part of the design process for us. It's one of those parts of the story where the costumes are giving you as much of the environment, I think, as the set is. It also made Bond and Paloma make sense to me. They're like these sort of iconic silhouettes in the middle of all this noise. I wanted the noise to feel a little seedy, a little dark, a little dangerous. The tux is probably the most iconic of the James Bond wardrobe looks. Tom Ford has a handful of shapes and we wanted to devise something that was specific to Daniel. So we took the best parts of some things that existed at, with a new version of a suit that they're currently developing. It was an amalgamation of those things. With Paloma, we wanted to make sure that she stood out from the crowd but was embedded. We knew that we wanted to probably have a diamond moment for her. Whatever the dress was couldn't sort of steal the thunder of the diamonds. Lots of Chopard pieces to choose from. It was really hard, but I felt like we found the right touch for her. However, the diamonds couldn't be the only thing that we were looking at, and she needed to look as a stunning whole package. The surprise of her being able to conduct all these crazy stunts in what seems like a diaphanous dress is the strength of that costume and that character. Mark's sets were breathtaking. He designed a poison garden for my character that felt like the greatest playground a villain could ask for. The detail and scale and scope of his work harkens back to those iconic Ken Adams sets, but with a modern twist. For our finale, our third act, we arrive at the lair of Safin. His family have brought from the Russians an island. For that, we've had to invent this island on which there is a testing plant of giant silos. And underneath the silos, when you open the, the missile doors, you go down below into a, a giant concrete brutalist subterranean factory. So we have that classic Ken Adam circular door that were opened to let the missile out. In many brutalist buildings, the lines are quite simple and bold. And I think the trick in that world is really not to over-elaborate it and keep it really simple so that it becomes really a sort of sculpture about light and dark. And that sort of forms a graphic language where you're seeing these very clean and simple shapes. We use that language, the Bond language of the sort of jumpsuit and these algae farm workers in pink inside our very monochromatic giant labyrinth. I found a picture of a Japanese designer of Isemiyaki kind of at his drafting table. There was something about this image that was sort of severe and serious, almost like I'm the architect of the world. And there was something about Seifen's character that had a sort of gentle arrogance like that. This image became the leaping off point for all the choices that we ended up making. Sutra is the definition of collaboration. Safin is such a meticulously evil person and I love how Sutra brought that meticulous precision to every one of his costumes. It's a real tribute, and it's quite fun to do the classic Bond sets, like M and Moneypenny's office. Each time that set comes about, it's evolved. Each design team adds a little piece. So we slightly adjusted the color of the lever on the door, and then we made a new painting. But fundamentally, the desk and everything else, it has been the same for a long time. So you just try and keep it in the same language. The sets are other characters in the movie, and they're really powerful um, characters and because they set the tone for everything. Mark 
He's just transporting us into the world that he's created every single time. He's literally giving us exactly what we need as actors to feel and sense and experience what our characters would be at every given moment. What I'm interested in is whether the film as a whole, with all its parts and pieces, is thrilling. The story, the lighting, the action is important. In fact, the performance is most important. So hopefully we've given the performers worlds that they felt excited by and involved in. And that will come out when we watch the film. I'm immensely proud of it because of just the huge collective effort that goes into making a Bond movie and being just a small part of that. It's an honor to be in that position.